Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show today. This is our first show that's been done daily. And as you can see, we have Welcome our first done little right. issue I am with the um, music Willis. repeating this itself. But now that we have taken that care of that, out of we will take this care of that of issue. We should be fine. As you know... Politics Done Right has been on on KPFT 90.1 FM on Thursdays at 3 p.m. As well as on Saturdays uh, under the Coffee Party banner. Well, things have changed and we are going to be doing things a bit differently. We are going now to a daily format that we hope um, you, you voted to have the daily format done on every day at 3 p.m. so as to coincide with the Thursday show. There will not be a 9 o'clock show anymore, uh, or rather a 12 o'clock show on Saturdays anymore, but as usual, we will have the show on a daily basis during the week. Now, folks, this is going to be uh, an entertaining show. It's not only going to be strict politics. It's not only going to be boring. It's not going to be just those things. What we're going to do is we're going to keep you informed. At the same time, we're going to keep you happy. Now, normally, as you all know, this is a call-in show. This is a call-in show, but uh, we didn't get the all the equipment ready to have Blog Talk Radio, which uh, connects all our telephones and our other networks together, but that will be forthcoming. I, I, I wanted to say that, I wanted to promise it on uh, sometime soon, but we're not going to make any promises that we, we can't keep. There's a whole lot of kinks that we have to get out of the system that we're working on right now, and we will do so. But for the time being, any information that you want or any questions that you want to ask, please feel free to ask it on, uh, make sure to ask it on through the, uh, through your computer, through Facebook Live which is where I am heading to to make sure that we're all set up correctly. Now, um, if you have any questions that, that has a priority, just let it be known that, this, that, that you want a priority response to it, and we'll do so as well. Now, um, this program is going to have, as I mentioned before, mostly politics, yes, but it's going to be the kind of politics that you want to hear. It's going to be the type of politics that move us forward. It's going to be the type of politics that um, progressives like. It's going to be the type of politics that we expect. Uh, while they wouldn't, they might not admit it. It's going to be the type of politics that right wingers like also. Because you know what? I found that over the times, I've spoken to quite a few people, right and left, and the one thing they want to do. The one, I mean, they, they either want to talk to you or they want to make things better as well. So it's not, uh, it, it, is, it, isn't, uh, it, it isn't something that isn't going to be there. But we have a great show for you today. Before I get started, what I want to do is I want to introduce our guest. I just want to get him to uh, give his name and later we're going to get into the blog of the week and then we'll move on from there. So... Let's go ahead and have it here with El Senor Rick Trevino. How are you doing, Rick? Well, um, I'm coming from San Antonio. Uh, uh, my name is Rick Trevino. I'm running for U.S. Congress in Congressional District 23. And um, I'm part of the progressive movement that's fighting for Medicare for all, a living wage, getting big money out of our political system, free public colleges, universities, you know, a moral foreign policy. So I'm very excited about this opportunity. I'm very excited to be here with you, Egberto. 
So what are we going to talk about today? Today is going to be a great show, folks. We have, uh, uh, we have Today Politics Done Right goes daily. We are still working on out the kinks with the new cameras, green screen and software. But we promised to launch the first week, mon the first Monday in January. Not the holiday Monday, but the first Monday in January. And by gosh, by hook or crook, I meant that I was going to keep that promise. We do not yet have the Blog Talk Radio Telephone System integrated into the new Facebook Live Wirecast software or the Behringer 12 channel mixer. I met Rick in Philly as both of us were uh, national Bernie Sanders delegate presenting Texas. Uh, so, I mean, um, we, we know her quite well. Uh, we spent together taking out fires while we were out there in Philadelphia. Uh, this is a good person. The leaf of absence to run uh, full time. Uh, that, well yes, okay. Here's the name of the the person that is running. Values and actions into serve. He's turning his values and actions into. It is a uh, the hashtag is politics done right, and you can go ahead and follow. Do you? Do you what time? It is. It's time for the weekly blog post. Okay, folks. The name of the blog post is 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 rather simple. It's okay? time for the weekly blog it is, post. And here we go again. Excellent. Now, the name of the blog post is if Trump falls, the entire Republican Party goes with him. Trump must fall. Goes as follows. Many Trump supporters sincerely believe he would be the savior from the Democrats and the Republicans. They voted for him to clean up the swamp. Unfortunately for them, Trump was a magnifying glass for Republicans. Never would they have believed they could unleash their level of selfish evil on Americans with a president that had professed he would blow the Republican Party establishment as well. Because Republicans are now complicit with Donald Trump in materially hurting Americans, when he fails, the Republican Party, as we know it, will fail as well. Paul Krugman captured that reality in his New York Times piece titled Faust on the Potomac. Krugman points out that instead of running away from Trump, Republicans are embracing him. It seems to me that the real news now is the way Republicans in Congress are dealing with this national nightmare rather than distancing themselves from Trump. They're doubling down on their support and in particular on their efforts to cover for his defects and crimes. The technique Republicans used for decades which was to play the people's most inner evils and carnal fears finally seemed to be or to have backfired. And this is how Krugman expressed it. For more than a generation, the Republican establishment was able to keep the bait and switch under control. Racism was deployed with, to win elections, then was muted afterwards, partly to preserve plausible deniability, partly to focus on the re prop priority of, en of enriching the 1%. But with Trump, they lost control. The base wanted someone who was blatantly racist and wouldn't pretend to be anything else. And that's what they got with corruption, incompetence, and treason on the side. Nonetheless, aside from a handful of never Trumpers, just about everyone in the Republican establishment decided that they could work with that. Trump very awfulness means that if he fails, the whole party will fail with him. Republicans could conceivably distance themselves from a president who turned out to be a bad manager or even one who turned out to have engaged in small time corruption. But when the corruption is big time and it's combined with the obstruction of justice and collaboration with Putin, nobody will notice which Republicans were a bit less involved, a bit less obsequious than others. If Trump sinks, he'll create a vortex that sucks down everyone involved. And so we now have the Republican Party as a whole fully complicit in Trump's crimes because that's what they are. Whether or not he and those around him are ever brought to justice. What this means, 
What this means, among other things, is that expecting the GOP to exercise any oversight or constraint Trump in any way is just foolish at this point. Massive electoral defeat. And this is where Rick Trevino comes in and all the other progressives running throughout this country. This is where it comes in. What this means, among other things, is that expecting the GOP to exercise any oversight and constraint is foolish. Trump, in any way, is foolish. What we need is massive, a defeat that is so massive that it overcomes the gerrymandering that we've spoken about on this show continuously. Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House, makes it very clear in one place that Republicans know all that is wrong about Donald Trump. But, as a TV commentator recently said, they are mercenaries there to use Donald Trump. I pointed this out in my last blog titled, Trump Not Smart Enough to Realize GOP Establishment Using Him as Well. Now, the real question is whether Democrats and progressives capitalize on the removal of the scab from the Republican Party. They better get their act together and coalesce around poor and middle class centric issues and stop the infighting. Folks, normally I would say the telephone number is, you know what? But I can't until we get our system set up. But with that, what I want to do is bring in our good man, El Senor, Rick Trevino. How are you doing, Rick? I'm doing well. Again, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I love the way you started this off with that blog post. You bring up a lot of good points, uh, specifically that the Republican Party must atone for the evil it unleashed on this world. And not to say that not to say that bigotry and racism didn't exist before Trump. It was there. But now uh, what the Republican Party has done is enabled this movement to, to be more powerful. And, and so, you know, the, the Southern strategy that Richard Nixon uh, instilled back in 1968 uh, that the GOP invested in for decades that culminated in the Trump movement. And you do see most of the Republican Party is completely embracing Trump. They're afraid of the base. But you then have Republicans in swing districts like mine, which really is a Democratic district, a district that is more progressive. And Will Hurd has been doing his best to distance himself from Trump. But you know, I'm sorry, buddy. You voted for Trump, and that stink don't come off. I could smell that vote from here. And uh, what what they've done, you know, the, what Donald Trump has done to the United States is increase our anxiety, has destabilized the world. Foreign policy is, is is becoming more violent and more hostile. And all this, like like you said, all this was done because they are mercenaries. They will work with whoever they have to to advance the agenda of the billionaire and business class. If that means working with an outright bigot, it means working with a bigot. If it means lying to their constituents, they will lie to their constituents. But really they are mercenaries and they are cutthroat. And they don't care really how much money they have to get on themselves as long as they pass tax cuts for the rich, which they did, they will work with anybody. And you know the Trump administration is very, horrifying to watch specifically because you know, I think the people that voted for Donald Trump were desperate I think they repudiated their the Republican Party just as much as they repudiated the Democratic Party and the, the, the media class and they are desperate and they were really looking for someone that was an outsider someone that was really going to buckle the system and unfortunately they put their they they put their hopes and dreams behind a charlatan, Donald Trump, who, with his full populism, promised the world. And now, what is he doing? He's doing everything he said he wouldn't do. He's bringing in Goldman Sachs. Yeah. I mean, talk about bringing in the swamp to the White House. And what we have to do as progressives is run from the left and offer the Democratic base and new voters a vision for a better America. 
It's not just enough to say Trump sucks. It's not just enough to get rid of Donald Trump. The Democratic Party must advance an agenda, and that's what I'm trying to do. A vision-oriented candidate that's uh, a working-class person himself representing working people. Let's go ahead and... Um... Let's go ahead and speak a little bit about you. First of all, let's let's uh, let me first explain to the audience here what we are doing. Um, we are going to be bringing in progressive candidates from throughout the country. One of the things that we've noticed is that, or and everybody has seen this over the years, is that you don't get uh, progressive candidates. Uh, uh, we but yet. enough etc etc so what we are going to do is we are going to get a hearing we will be doing that going forward so what I'd like you to do is tell us a little bit about yourself first of all great uh, well I was born and raised in Laredo Texas which is a border town uh, right across the river, the Rio Grande is oh, Laredo, Mexico. That's where my mother's from. So I'm a border child. You know, I grew up in Laredo. Uh, I understand the experience of living on the border. And border communities are safe. But they have been vilified by our political class to seem dangerous. But it's really not true. Uh, I moved to San Antonio to pursue my education. I got my political science degree at UTSA. And then I... Uh, recently received my master's in educational leadership from Trinity University to be a principal and to understand me you have to understand my background as a teacher you know, it's an experience that changed my life I worked on the east side of San Antonio at Sam Houston High School and I like to say like LBJ I got my first lesson in poverty as a teacher and uh, to see what poverty does to a community every single day what it does to parents and children and the elders you know, it, it, it's really, it's, it's really horrifying to witness that. And what, what I, and traveling all across this district, what it's, it's more proof to me that the, the, the entity that is missing in people's lives is an active federal government. And there are so many things that we could do, practic uh, we could do practical things to better the lives of working class people. And uh, that's increasing the, increasing the minimum wage to a living wage. Guaranteeing health care is a fundamental human right, moving to Medicare for all. These are just some solutions that the government should advance that will dramatically benefit the lives of the most vulnerable and working class of this country. And uh, I left the four rooms of, uh, of the four walls of my classroom to you know, try to influence my district and my city and advance a type of politics that typically isn't found here in South Texas. Now, I am a progressive. I do come from the left. And I do represent the future of the Democratic Party. And another thing, I'm a working class person. And most of the time, the people that run for office aren't working class people. I mean, how many people do you know who could take a year off from work, right? Right. And the people that do, that, that have the luxury of taking a year off from work to campaign for U.S. Congress or something like that, they see the, the world a lot differently than someone that lives paycheck to paycheck or a college student or a working family you know and it's unfortunate that those perspectives those life experiences aren't found in DC and that's why we have a country that completely serves the one percent and the multinationals and Wall Street the billionaire class you know we have a gut we have a government and representatives that don't necessarily represent us but represent the business class of this country and that needs to change and the way Democrats win is by abandoning uh, abandoning their donors and and embrace the working class and create a party that is authentically a party of the working class. That is excellent. Um, I, one of the things that I, I, I question came over the um, the internet here on Facebook Live, and the, the uh, uh, Josie questions your critiques of uh, Beto O'Rourke. And I think you and I spoke about that a bit last night. But before you answer, I, I like where your face is now because sometimes you move over out of the box. So I mean, move over a little bit to the right, my right, if you will. Right. The, the, the other side, the other side. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, she, she is concerned about your criticism of, of, of I don't think was a criticism, but a, 
But tell me a little bit about your thoughts. Well, first, look, in a democracy, debate shouldn't be controversial. When, when do we ask hard questions of the people that are, that are supposed to represent us? I mean, Senate is an important job, and in a primary is the opportunity where you ask these questions. Now, uh, Beto recently came out with this idea of requiring service, mandatory service um, to all young people, no matter how rich or how poor. And my criticism is, is I really don't think this is about service. I think it's more bipartisan pandering by Beto O'Rourke. And what he's trying to do is create the optics of bipartisanship. And he's going to use this bill to fulfill that. And if, if, by, if, if this is about bipartisan pandering, to subject young people and impose this huge burden on them just to achieve some short-sighted campaign goal, I think is absolutely ridiculous. You know, and, and another thing, this service component wasn't asked on their generation or generations past. And another thing, the idea that service itself, no matter what, that it will lead to good things, I think is a is a false it, it, it's a false uh, uh, yeah. narrative. Description. It's a false narrative because we already make the the world itself right now is we have an unequal economy, an unfair society, and we're just going to make another loop. Kids have to jump through just so that they can enter this class divided society. I don't think it it, it works out, and also. The current offer that we're offering our kids isn't a good deal anyways. Either you go to college and walk out with tens of thousands of, stu uh, tens of, thousands of dollars of loans with high interest rates, or you don't go to college and you live a life out of below poverty. So now we're going to add another service component to really a miserable world for young people. That We're the generation, millennials and young people, have we incur so much debt at such an early age. No other generation in your sister ever have to have to deal with this. And if you really want to benefit, if you really want to benefit young people's lives, it's not to impose some type of service uh, on onto them and making it compulsory. But what you do is you make college more affordable. You decrease the debt on student loans. You create a vibrant economy that has authentic pathways into the middle class. You know, you you have a you provide health care. You, you create a society that is fair and allows them to self-actualize as adults. I just think that uh, that it, it's just unfair. I really think it's it's profoundly unfair. And uh, and and lastly, the idea that this bipartisan being bipartisan on this bill that it will lead to other bipartisan legis legislative wins is a joke. This is a politically low stakes bill. And yes, there's a Republican willing to work with Beto O'Rourke to impose the service component on all people. And can you imagine the lecture, the condescending lecture that will come from the right winger too on that? But anyways, just because you're, you have success on this low-stakes political bill, that doesn't mean that they're going to be bipartisan on, on instituting Medicare for all. Or, men, or, or, or they're not going to have bipartisan support on lifting the, the minimum wage to a living wage. We have seen eight years of Republican obstructionism with the Obama administration. What further proof do you need? Right now, bipartisanship, really, you only see it on foreign policy issues and issues on finance. But when it comes to issues that will benefit working families and the most vulnerable, you will never see any bipartisanship on those things. So I am skeptical of, of Bethel Works' uh, plan. I don't think it's going to make anybody's life any better. And there are things right now in society that are profoundly unfair, and we need to rectify those things before we start imposing more criteria into entering the society to kids. No, I, I, I have to agree with you uh, wholeheartedly. I am really tired myself of watching progressives try to uh, become uh, Republican lights. The, the, the thing about it is um, the, the, the numbers are out. The statistics are there. Most Americans won't call themselves liberals or progressives. They won't. The one thing that the polls, however, indicate when you ask them what they want is that they are, in fact, progressives based on what they need. So Rick Trevino doesn't have to go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to try to convert you to a progressive. I'm going to try to turn you into a Democrat. You just have to go out there and say, this is what 
I want to do and based on the numbers this is what but, 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 and that is what we need to work on and we need progressives who are willing to go out there and say that and I'm glad that you are one of those well and if you look at if you, again if you look at the, the issues that you know myself and tens and tens of candidates all across this country are running on you know, health care is a fundamental right it has support on both the left and the right and right the thing is we're, we're leading on issues that have broad bipartisan support and really what these issues will do in a campaigns like the ones I, I'm running what they will do will, will is first they will inspire the democratic base and two they will bring in new voters right and that's how you win. We we inspire the Democratic base, get them out to vote, and then bring new new voters into the fold. And by chance, if Republicans want to come along, cool, that's great. Come along for the ride because we are offering the best choice for America. But you know, you don't have to necessarily pander all the way towards the right because pandering to the right and and is delusional to think that they will vote with you or side with you. 93% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump. A majority voted for Roy Moore. Even if you present, and like, let's talk about bipartisanship anyways, the idea that through facts, logic, and, and context is going to convince and change the Republicans' mind on these hardcore economic issues is completely false. They have a job to do. They have an agenda. It's to serve the Koch brothers and the billionaires. And it doesn't matter what kind of rationale or treatment that you bring you bring to them they're going to say no they're not going to work with you and look at how look at what they're doing in the senate they don't need 60 votes to get what they don't need 60 votes to get their agenda done they change the rules to make it 51 and now they're exactly getting, now they got the biggest tax cut that billionaires have seen in decades we shouldn't call it a tax cut we need to to tax scam a scam robbery you know you're right it's again more of the same watching a huge redistribution of wealth from the middle class to the top one percent and that's that's something that that the democratic party needs to recognize right now in this historical moment what we need to do to be successful as a movement is to have more democrats in office than they do and then we advance our agenda and this agenda will benefit the lives of all people whether they're republicans or democrats and then our the outcomes themselves will lead people back to the democratic party but if we continue to be a party that just says, well, we need to work with the other side and we need a bipartisan consensus or we need to bring the country together, you know, I think that type of politics, it sounds nice, but it's not going to help us achieve Medicare for all. It's not going to help us achieve a living wage. There are opportunities to do bipartisan work. But right now, what we need to do is get more Democrats in office. And that's how you guarantee we have health care as a right. I want to make a little correction to what you just said. You said that we need to get Democrats in office. My contention is what we need to get more in office are progressives. Because, again, we have a whole lot of Democrats out there that are nothing more than Democrat. Uh, well, uh, Republican light is what I should say. They, 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 they want to be just progressive enough to, to give the, a few spoils to the peons. However, they are by nature corporatists, okay? And, and that is what we extricate. I, I'm not saying extricate them from the party, but what I'm saying, what needs to be done is to ensure that their influence is much less than it is right now. You bring up a great point. You know, I, I misspoke. You're, you're right. Like, it's not, just, it's not just a Democrat. You have to be an authentic progressive. Like I say, a bona fide progressive, right? And... Right now, for, for, too many, for too many years, being progressive was just supporting issues on LGBTQ or uh, you know, women's issues or issues around civil rights. And those have been the issues of the Democratic Party. But you never see any of these social justice warriors like that are or whatever, that, that these so-called progressive Democrats ever challenge the economic system that we have, ever challenge the foreign po policy that we wage. And that's, this, this era, that's the true testament of the progressive. Whether or not you have the guts to challenge the, 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 the billionaire class and the 1% and, and create, a, create a party that actually works for working people. That's the challenge.
And uh, I, I love what you just said um, that many folks have refused to challenge our economic system. Uh, the many people tend to, and I, I, I say this all the time, many people tend to believe that the economic system is divine. The economic system is man-made and the economic system should be to serve us, not for us to serve some model. And what we have been doing in society over the last several, I want to say decades, but it's really centuries. serving not us but a few and it sounds like a cliche but the numbers don't lie something that if you just look at you know I'm a history teacher and context is important right right and relatively speaking capitalism is a, is a new human phenomenon it's been around a couple hundred years and it's been right. evolving right and what we see now is a mature capitalist system and the outcomes are right there we saw them. We saw them in the Great Depression. We're seeing them now again. We're seeing a huge, huge gap between the super rich and everybody else. I mean, there was a, a Bloomberg article that came out a few weeks ago, and it said that the richest 400 people in one year made one trillion dollars. Right. So this is a global phenomenon, right? And this is what what some people call neoliberalism, right? And all neoliberalism is, for those who don't know out there, right? All neoliberalism is, is using government and, or, or thinking that government choices must serve capitalist interests, that they must work hand in hand. Every decision we make has to serve the, the profit motive of some company, some industry, and it, if it doesn't, it's inappropriate. And I think that's bogus because, you know, we, we have to be critical of the economic system that we have. Yes, there are people that are very successful in the system, but there are a few. For most people I speak to, they're not making it. For most elderly people that I speak to in the district, they're not able to retire with dignity. Young people are graduating into an economy that has no place for them. And then on top of that, there's a narrative that it's our fault. There's a narrative that, if, that, that the billionaires work harder than us. And... If, you, if you're not a billionaire, if you're not rich, it reflects some character flaw in you. I think that's bogus because some of the hardest working people I know work two, three jobs, 50, 60 hours a week. How is that lazy? How is that, you know, providing for your family, keeping a roof over your head, come hell or high water, doing what you got to do, how is that lazy? I mean, the, the, the narrative of work people and the working class, the stories we tell about ourselves are so harsh. We need, we need a political system that has the guts to really call that out. And that's why I'm running. And, and then some people, they don't like my tone. They think that my tone is inappropriate or that I'm a dangerous character. And the billionaires and the, the multinationals, they do see me as dangerous. And they're right. I'm a danger to them because they have been a danger to our lives. The fact that they, their profit motive is more important than our quality of life is ridiculous. You know, look at Wall Street. Look at the people that are running the White House. Gary Cohn, Steve Mnuchin. These slugs who worked for Goldman Sachs defrauded hundreds of thousands of homeowner, home, homeowners, pensioners all across this globe. They, they don't go to jail, and on top of that, they're still invited to Washington. And you know their suggestions of fixing our problem? Cut Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I mean, this country right now is a joke. Are, we are we are being run by by a TV show host, and we have a Democratic Party that doesn't even embrace its base. The Democratic Party base wants health care as a right. It wants Medicare for all. It wants a living wage. It wants free public college universities, and they've wanted it for decades. But what you have now is the Democratic Party just put people in front of us, like in my race, it's Jay Hewlings or Gina Jones. And what their job is to do is to manage your expectations, to manage your expectation about what, what government can give to you and to wait on our time until you get health care. And I'm sorry. I'm not going to wait anymore. We need it now. There are people hungry now. There are people sick and dying right now. We can't wait until the business class feels it's appropriate to give us health care. And what are they going to offer? Some market-based solution that's going to gouge out you know, our, our pocketbooks with high premiums and deductibles? I mean, we've had... I mean, neoliberalism is done with. We need to move away from it. And this movement that I'm offering and I'm running on is that alternative. It's a, it's a government, like they say, you know, the, 
the government could act as the conscience of the bit of our economy. There are some really shady actors in our economy. Are- Rick, I want to interrupt and say because yeah. when you talk about the government, every t- uh, what the Powell Manifesto and others have been successful in doing is making people forget exactly what the government is. Government is we the people. If government is we the people, we decide what type of economy we want. We decide what kind of business model we want to create. We don't leave that for a few, the omnipotent, to decide. And what we have done since the inception of this country is do exactly that. And the way we have done that is to deprive people of their own self-worth. And if you think you're, if you don't have that self-worth, if you believe that somebody else is going to do something for you or you so much more believe, 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 believe is right, then you don't have the wherewithal to fight. What I loved about the, uh, the, the Bernie movement and this, the movement going forward, the progressive movement that has come out, out of that, is that we have people who know their self-worth. We have people who know now why. They ask the question, why? When somebody says, uh, we need to do this for growth, we ask, why? Growth for whom? Yeah. We've had growth uh, continuously, but the growth has not been for the average American citizen and nobody in nobody really of consequence that been elected ask why are their constituencies not doing as well as the economic activity that has occurred over the last several decades dictates and yeah. that is why we need new candidates you're, you're exactly right like you know Donald Trump you know always mentions the fact that all oh, the stock the Dow Jones is at 2500 or whatever and or 25,000 and that doesn't matter most people don't benefit from from the gains of the Dow Jones industrial averages the S&P 500 most people are you know are nine to five people that make their money off of their income or their pension and their retirement you know it and 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 if that's the if that's the signpost of of where our economy is you know it's it's inauthentic it's not really describing where we're at because most people if you look at real unemployment it's high you know you have a lot of people that are working longer hours for lower wages you know the purchasing power of the minimum wage now is less than it was in 1968 you know kids are walking out with that average 30,000 in home debt young people are getting married later in life find homes later in life find cars later in life certain families later in life all these are a direct consequence of a weak economy and it's an economy also that is a evolved from a manufacturing economy to a tertiary service-based economy and these aren't jobs that you know are pathways to the middle class and are pathways into being able to retire with dignity and young people like myself we're watching our parents and our elders retire and it's rough they're having a hard time retiring with dignity and we need to reform the system for them strengthen their social security strengthen their cola the cost of living adjustments on those benefits and tie them to inflation you know, we need to make sure that we have a healthcare system that could really, you know, uh, you know really provide services for the, the the large baby boomer population. And those investments will come when we say as a society, healthcare is a fundamental right, and that no one in America should live in poverty. And once as a society we make these these proclamations, then we make those investments. Because if we don't, we're going to inherit this country, and this country doesn't work for anybody but the super rich. Well, I mean, we are in the position now with this country, and one of the reasons um, myself and many other activists are doing what we do is we know what the consequences of the path that we're on. And the reality is the consequences of the path that we're on is, is and, and folks, I'm just telling you as it is, revolution. The truth of the matter is any country who reaches this level of inequality, any country who reaches this level where a vast majority by a, a, a relative minority, they revolt. And that is exact. And it's not, America is not immune to that. But there's one big problem in America. It is a very well armed country. And we should remember that. And the folks who are armed are, are, are some people in the country, not, not, 
the battle on the same side with us all. But funny you, uh, you kind of bring up the gun issue, and it's interesting. Like the people that own AR-15s, the way those guns are marketed towards the class of people that buy these guns. You know, it's it, it, it is marketed with revolutionary tones. Like they themselves are going to be the vanguards of the people, even though. There have been a lot of examples of the government overstepping, and those people are silent and actually encourage real oppression and tyranny that does take place. The Patriot Act, you know, what go, what what happened, what happened in Ferguson, or what's going on with police brutality or criminal justice system. This is oppression, and again, the the gun thing is unusual. You know, it is cultural, and you're right. I, I think that we we can't get complacent as a society and think that we're post historical as if these things can't happen to us. They can, and we have to be vigilant. And right now, now there was a book by Steve Fraser who, uh, who wrote this book called The Age of Acquiescence. And he said, like, we are in a second Gilded Age. The difference between the first Gilded Age is that people stood up and fought for themselves and spilled blood for the rights that we have now that we enjoy as working people. The Pullman strike, you know, the Knights of Labor. Right. Spell, and all their fights, it was a violent, hard struggle. But now in our era, we don't see that. Is this an age of acquiescence? I don't know. But I'm part of a movement that isn't acquiescing, but is fighting back. And fighting back out of necessity because we need to. Right now, things aren't working. And the fact that, that, that look, I'm running as a Democrat, and I have some harsh things to say about the Democratic Party. And some people aren't comfortable with that. And we need to move away from that mentality. You know, the Democratic Party isn't perfect. We need to make it the party that, that really serves us. And we have to have, ask hard questions. And in a primary, there has to be a reformative aspect to your campaign. And I want to reform the party. In most campaigns, that's not there. Most campaigns is just about Trump sucking and the Republicans being idiots and all that. I mean, that's that's easy stuff. That's low hanging fruit. What are you going to do for me? You're elected. We beat the Republicans. Now what? We got rid of Trump. Now what? We still have a society that created those conditions. We still have a society that exploits people. We need real outcomes. We need to offer people real things and have a vision and be idealistic and run towards that idealistic future and not be afraid to hold ourselves at high standards. Because here's the thing. I'm running a very principled campaign. I'm, I have an authority to speak out on the Democratic Party because of the way I'm running my campaign. And if I renege, if I take money from a corporate donor, if I take money from a lobbyist, or I, I, I embrace... Uh, you know, capitalist interest. I will lose this form. I will lose this place, and rightly so. I'm, I, I, I love that I'm running on such a principal campaign with such high standards because that's what we need. We need people to actually walk the walk, not just talk a good game. And that's what I'm doing. I'm running a, a campaign that's completely funded by grassroots people, that's independent of establishment power, and that's there. That is only interested to serve the people. And if we don't have a politics like that in the future, you're right. This this American experiment will end. I, exactly right. Um, uh, it, it's funny that uh, I heard an interview on PBS with Murray, the guy who wrote The Bell Curve, who tried to associate intelligence with race and intelligence with class, etc. Uh, he came on, he was interviewed yesterday by, uh, I don't remember the woman on, on PBS, but he said he has lost complete hope in America. <laughs> well, well, he should thank himself for uh, making his stupid bell curve so chic intellectually to justify, to find a way to justify people's places in society, to explain the way why some people aren't performing better. It must be some character flaw. It must be intelligence. No, it can't be the fact that we have a society that is fundamentally white supremacist and unfair, right? It can't be that. No, it has to be something else. And that guy is part of the reason why we're here. A lot of these pseudo-intellectual people with their fast food philosophy, right, that anybody could pick up, they, they read that book, they think that there's some smart person, and, they in, and then they impose awful, awful legislation and policies that affect people's lives everywhere. The education system has been a joke because of people like him. So if he's, if he's upset about the future of America, well, it's kind of your fault, buddy. But yeah, he actually played a, uh, an integral part of it so, uh, in that as well. So, I mean, th that is so true. So let's, let's uh, we only have about... 13 minutes left, so let's talk a little bit about your um, your campaign. Tell me how it's going and uh, what do you want out of the people that are watching this throughout the country. Remember, this is not only 
in Texas, but throughout the country. Tomorrow we'll have somebody on from another progressive on from Georgia who is in a race, a, a, a type of race like you against uh, uh, some against someone the staff would prefer as well. Yeah, yeah. So my, I think my race is going great. You know, South Texas and Texas itself really hasn't been given an opportunity to vote for candidates like me. Not to say there hasn't been analogs to candidates like me, but not in these areas. And what I see is a progressive district that has been labeled conservative by the establishment because they want people to believe that it is so that they could justify bringing in some moderate who's going to cultivate strong ties with the business industry like fossil fuels or private prisons because there are Democrats that that have strong ties with these industries and they're cultivated in districts like mine. Uh, I've traveled to dozens of cities, you know, just tomorrow I'm going to be in Carrizo Springs for a town hall, then I'm in Dilly the next day for another town hall. Hey Rick, move a little bit to right because you're kind of, kind of, kind of good. a little bit more over. There you go. Excellent. Uh, oh yeah, so I'm, I'm traveling, and then I'm going to Presidio, Texas on Friday, then El Paso, and in every town I go into, big or small. I mean, I've been to a, a city as small as Valentine, you know, less than, a, around a hundred and some people to Asherton, Texas, about you know, a little over a thousand. And what I'm seeing are are cities where roads aren't paved. I'm seeing places that don't have real broadband access. I'm seeing places that don't have real healthcare facilities, or have one rural healthcare clinic to provide healthcare to tens of thousands of people around the area. And it's not like the people, the mayors, and the city council, and the commissioners, and the county judges. It's not like they're not trying their best. They're doing what they can with what they've been given. And what's missing again is the federal government. And it, it was crazy. I, I was I was in Carrizo. No, I was in Crystal City. I walked into a healthcare clinic called Vida Vida de Salud. And that day was the day the Senate just passed a sixty billion dollar allocation to the Department of Defense, more than they asked for. They were giving billions of dollars more to the Department of Defense. And I had to explain to a rural healthcare clinic why is it that their funds are going to be on the chopping block. The priorities of this country are all messed up, and if you travel District 23, you'll see what that leads to. You lead to places that don't have real 21st century infrastructure. You have places that feel politically disenfranchised, and you have people really looking that are desperate for real representation. And Will Hurd will come out there saying, hey, I'm doing a great job. But what, we, well, what he really is doing is empowering the oppressors of this country. And, and making corporate tyranny a reality for the future. And we need to get Will Hurd out of there and put a real progressive in there because my platform, for example, there's 160,000 people in my district that don't have health care. 160,000 men, women. It, it, it really is a mind-boggling number. Medicare for all will immediately benefit their lives. It will benefit the lives of the elderly, the working people there, and also will take away the burden of providing health care from municipalities who pay a lot to, to, to pay for the health care of their, of their public servants. You know, there's so much that can be done with this move, and that's just one issue. Uh, my real vision, though, for District 23 is that we have the most dynamic, clean energy economy in the world. Now, District 23 is in a unique position because it's the largest congressional district in the country, stretching from El Paso all the way down to Catula. It has over 800 miles of U.S.-Mexico border. It's got plains and plateaus and mountains. It's got every, almost every geographical feature you could think of. And we are in a unique position to leverage every clean energy revolution that you could think of. Solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, it's all right there because of our land that's undeveloped. And I want to see people coming into my district, people from around the world coming into my district and learn what we did to leverage our environment to provide a sustainable economy and, a, and, a, and to be stewards of our environment. Like, like the Dakota Access uh, protest said, you know, Mina was shown, you know, water is life. We have to learn how to live with the environment, not against it. And these precious resources that we have in West Texas, water, you know, yeah, those things need to be protected by the government and by the people. And it, and it comes by who we're electing. Um, another thing I really want to see is, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders called for this, and it's a huge investment in our infrastructure. Over 90% of the district doesn't have real broadband access. So you're driving around, calls drop, and some cities have better wi uh, 
better internet than others. And why is it that just because you live in a big city, your your internet and your service and your infrastructure is better than some rural city? I mean, you're both Americans. You deserve the equal kind of you deserve equal opportunity. And I, it's my it's my responsibility as a congressman to make make those things equal and it, provide incentives to create that broadband uh, network. Uh, another thing that I really am moving towards is criminal justice reform. Something that I'm very passionate about. One of the, the industries that is growing in 23 is the private prison industry. And the private industry, private prison industry to me is inherently evil. There's a profit motive to incarcerating people. And the people that they're incarcerating aren't violent criminals. They're women and children. And I've spoken to people that work for Geo Group and CCA. And they're not proud of what they do. They see who they're locking up. And they... And people want to know that they're doing a job that is good for this, good for society. Private prison reflects a sickness in our society, a real human rights crisis. We have a fourth of all the prisoners in the world, 25%. We have more prisoners than China, and they have three times as many people as, as us. And they're apparently some communist, dictatorship, oppressive country. <laughs> and they arrest people at, at, at a lesser rate than we do. And on top of that, while that's happening, while I see communities that are being affected by the, the, the war on drugs or immigration, at the same time, I'm looking at Washington, D.C., and seeing some of the most pampered people to ever walk this earth completely walk, even though they committed gigantic crimes. And we have our criminal justice system is broken, it's unfair, and we need to dramatically reform it because it is, it is an oppressive force. It is disproportionately affecting poor people, minorities, and we shouldn't be subject to so much government coercion. You know, Sonia Sotomayor said in a, in a, in a recent Supreme Court case in Utah versus Strafe, I think that's what it's called, but there was a great quote in it, and she says, we are no longer citizens in a democracy, but, sub, uh, but uh, subjects waiting to be categorized. You know, it's, we are, wow, wow, profound. It, it really is. It's like, because the reality is, if you're black, there's a or there's over a forty percent chance that you're gonna get stopped by a cop. If you're Hispanic, it's close to forty percent. If you're white, it's over thirty percent. So the story is that, that if you're in America, more than likely you're gonna get stopped by a cop. They and, have to feed the prison industrial complex. <laughs> that's right. The, the prison industrial complex, and the, these are things that I have. You know, morally, I, it hurts. It hurts that my country that I love so much is participating in this. And at the same time, we have a Democratic Party that ostensibly is against these things, but at the same time embraces it and uses the money from these industries. That needs to change. We need a new Democratic Party that doesn't play ball with these characters anymore. Rick Trevino, congressional candidate for U.S. House of Texas, District 23. And uh, One last thing. Uh, if you guys could go to my website at rickfor23.com, a small donation could go a long way. Right now we're fundraising towards our mailer. Uh, we raised $15,000. We're in this runoff. Uh, donate what you can and follow me at, at ricktd23 on Twitter. You know, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I made a, a, a mistake in one of the headers that, that we did for you, but it is it did say 23 in the other one. Let me tell you, first of all, it's been a pleasure having you on. It was a pleasure meeting you in um, uh, Philadelphia as a Bernie Sanders delegate. You impressed the holy hell out of me there, and there are not a whole lot of people uh, in this business that do that. So um, thank you so kindly for being the very first person, the very first guinea pig <laughs> on Politics Done Right Daily. We're... And for the audience out there, we're going to get these things all cleaned up in in um, in the future. We'll we'll figure all those things out. Thank you for for listening. You have a good one. I got to cut out and give my exit, my friend. Thank you for being here, Rick Rick Trevino. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. 
Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four.